Good evening, and a Merry Christmas to all of you. We are privileged tonight as we go back to those carols and those lessons to let the Word of God just tell us, speak to us, God's gift sent to us in the form of a child. We'll, we'll uh, follow the order of worship as printed in your service folder. I don't think he put, no, nope, didn't think so. There's too many hymns, so you follow the, follow the hymns as printed in here. Most of them you'll find in your, uh, the red hymnal in the pew in front of you. Otherwise, pay attention to who's, who's singing and who's not. Choir will be singing, some soloists will be singing, and all of it, of course, giving glory and praise to our God in heaven above. We'll begin with our first hymn then, as each happy Christmas as printed in your service folder. Please stand. Beloved in Christ, in this Christmas season, it is our duty and delight to hear again the message of the angels and in heart and mind to go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us, the Christ child lying in a manger. Let us read and learn in Holy Scripture the story of the loving purposes of God from the first days after our fall and into the birth and glorious redemption brought to us by this holy child. Let us hear how peace was lost and how peace is restored. But first let us pray, for this is good and right. Holy Father, we pray for ourselves and all people who worship you and your Son this holy night. By your holy word, lead us to say with the angels, We pray for your blessing upon the people of our city, our state, our nation, and our world. We pray for the poor and the helpless, the cold and hungry, the sick and the sad, that you would give them the joy of your salvation and the comfort of your presence. We pray for unbelievers and enemies of the church, that through your law and gospel, you would lead them to recognize your Son as their only hope for eternal life. Finally, we remember before you all those who rejoice with us in heaven, who live in greater light and beauty than we, that multitude which no one can number, who died in faith and now praise you in your heavenly temple. We confess that we are united with them and with one another. We humbly offer up these prayers and praises in the words that Christ himself taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Before we get into our readings from God's Word this evening, we start out with a question, and that, that's kind of going to be the question that is answered tonight as we go through these readings. The question is this, if, if you were God, 
I know it's kind of a stretch. <laughs> but you and I want to be God all the time. We try to pretend like we're God. We tell God what he should be doing. We like to know or think that we know better than him. But humor me for a moment tonight. What, what if you were God? How would you do it? How would you tell you in the world who you were? How would you show the world who you were? Would you just show up on the scene and quite literally scare the life out of people? Because that's what would happen. God just showed up in all of his glory. Not a person could stand in front of him. That's probably not the right way. So what would you do? Would you show up kind of in a behind a mask? So they couldn't, you, nobody could really see you, but they would kind of see kind of a picture of you? Would that be you? Would you not come to earth because it would just be too much? Or maybe would you say, eh, it's kind of a waste of time. Those guys on the earth, they don't really want to pay any attention to me anyway. they, they got better things to do, and they, all they want to do is chase around after their own dreams, much less listen to me or give me any praise and glory and honor. So how would you do it? The only way you could do it is the way that God did. What's the most unassuming, the most... The, the way that someone could come to you in a way that is innocent yet not intimidating. Humble, helpless, yet filled with so much power you don't even notice it. What's the way that God would choose through time to tell the world again and again this magnificent way that he's going to not only make a promise but then repeat that promise in prophecy over and over again and com completely keep those promises, all of them, until finally he would show up on the scene. How? As a child. Is that how you would do it? Well, that's how God did it. Marvel tonight as we see what a child this is. We start back at the beginning. When this child was promised as a savior, when humanity was separated from God, falling into sin, of course through Adam and Eve, as a tragic result, the account would end though with God's promise given. The offspring of the woman, a child, Christ, would ultimately defeat Satan and restore us to God in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve heard the voice of the Lord God who was walking around in the garden during the cooler part of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid myself. God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit from the tree and I ate it. The Lord God said to the woman, what have you done? The woman said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the livestock and more than every wild animal. You shall crawl on your belly and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put hostility between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head, and you will crush his heel. God's word. We'll continue with our first hymn, Now Sing We Now Rejoice.
Little hints would be given as time would go by, as we see a child would be foretold. Symbolic language in Isaiah's 11th chapter describes that child, that gift. More than 700 years before he would come upon the scene, as we pay attention to the authority and the power that he brings, as a child even, we see that his rule extends over all the earth and we note the blessings he brings. Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot will spring up from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will be delighted with the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, nor will he render decisions based on what he hears with his ears. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor, and he will render fair decisions in favor of the oppressed on the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips, he will put the wicked to death. Righteousness will be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his hips. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, the calf, the young lion, and the fattened calf together, and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze together, and their young ones will lie down together. The lion will eat straw like the cattle. The nursing child will play near a cobra's hole, and the weaned child will put his hand into a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is God's word. We sing our next hymn, number 47.
as we heard earlier, it would have to come from the seed of Eve. It would have to be someone from God's chosen people. A child would come from the nation of Israel. And yet, God does not send this promised child to the huge country, not to the huge city, but to this little town in kind of the middle of nowhere that nobody really even pays much attention to. And he's so specific about it that you can't miss it. You can't say the prophet didn't tell you where this child would be born. You couldn't say that the prophecy wouldn't be talking about this Christ child Because even in Micah chapter 5, we see how specific the wonder of that fulfilled prophecy is as he continues to convince you and me, people today, of the validity of this child as God's own son. Micah chapter 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, from you will go out the one who will be the ruler for me in Israel. His goings forth are from the beginning, from the days of eternity. Therefore the Lord will give them up until the time when the woman who is in labor bears a child. Then the remaining survivors from his brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd with the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. They will dwell securely For at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This is the word of our God. Our choir continues with Late at Night. I asked you before, if you were God, how you'd do it. In order for God to come to this earth, 
it would only make sense that he would have to do a miracle in order for him to have anything to do with us. It's impossible for sinners to be in the presence of a holy God. This we know from the scriptures. So if God's going to do that, it would only make perfect and logical sense that he would have to do a miracle. He would have to become one of us. And he would have to be born in such a way that would be beyond our understanding. We say he's conceived in a Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. We make this claim not because it's believable in our minds, not because it's how we do it, but because this is how God chose to bless the world with this gift. And then we, like Mary, humbly accept it through faith. The child comes through a miracle in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin pledged in marriage to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings. You who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But she was greatly troubled by the statement and was wondering what kind of greeting this could be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, because you have found favor with God. Listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One, to be born, will be called the Son of God. Listen, your, uh, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, even though she was called barren. And, and this is her sixth month. For nothing, is impos- nothing will be impossible for God. Then Mary said, See, I am the Lord's servant. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. These are God's words. Our next song will be sung by a soloist, My Soul Will Magnify the Lord. My soul will magnify the Lord. I rejoice in God my Savior. In the wonder of his favor. For he has done great things for me. He was mindful of his servant. Every age shall call me blessed. The hope of Abraham come in the giving of a son for he who promised is mighty in remembering his mercy my soul will magnify the lord for his grace to those who fear him through every generation the proud he scatters to the wind as the ruler's strength is broken and the rich are left with nothing the humble lifted high and the hungry satisfied our portion and our treasure our hope and help forever
if God is going to have any kind of relationship with us, he's going to have to do something and move in our direction because we are powerless and impotent to be able to do so toward him. In fact, we by nature don't even want to. And so if God's going to show his desire to save us, he's going to put it in words and promise and prophecy, then he's also going to put it in the flesh. He's going to be that Emmanuel. By the way, this is the only, if you want to call it religion, where God comes to you. Every other religion says you need to go and find God. You need to work your way to God, not the true God. His name means Emmanuel. He comes as a child to be with us. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. His mother Mary was pledged in marriage to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her, so he decided to divorce her privately. As he was considering these things, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this happened to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Look, the virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife, but he was not intimate with her until she gave birth to her firstborn son, and he named him Jesus. This is the word of our God. Our next solo, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
So the promise is made. The prophecy has been foretold. The child is supposed to be coming. Now, how do you arrange everything? How do you make sure that all the prophecy happens and you say, well, he's God, he can do whatever he wants? Sure. But how do you do that with an entire world of people who are all kind of making their own decisions and doing whatever they want? And how do you get this child in that place that we heard back in the first couple sets of lessons in Bethlehem, Ephrathah? How do you make it all happen? And how do you do it in such a way that it all fits together with all of those 66 books and thousands of pages and tens of thousands of verses of God's Word and yet still fit in with all of history. None of it, none of it is mixing God from secular world. None of it is mixing information and, well, what the world would call a conspiracy. It's all verifiable by history. It's all verifiable by the Word of God. And it's all put in place by the hand of God. Through a pompous leader and some humble little soon-to-be husband and wife, confused, (laughs) trying to figure it all out. And yet God makes it happen. The child arrives, Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governing Syria, and everyone went to register, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the town of Nazareth, into Judea, to the town of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was from the house and family line of David. He went to be registered with Mary, his wife, who was pledged to him in marriage and was expecting a child. And so it was that while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. These are God's words. Let's sing Away in a Manger, hymn number 68.
The plan was set in motion. The promise was made. The prophecy made. The promise was kept. The prophecy fulfilled. The child was now here. True God. True man as he needed to be for us and for our salvation. So now what? you got to send out some birth announcements, right? How'd God do that? There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. There was no... Well, maybe there was. Some sort of newspaper. Word of mouth? Do you rely on that? No, God would send his most trusted messengers. But ironically, he would not send them to the king. He would not send them to the huge metropolis of maybe it was Jerusalem or even Rome. (laughs) I laugh because he sent them out in the middle of nowhere. Send them to a bunch of shepherds. Nobody wanted anything to do with them. And they're the first ones to hear the birth announcement of this God, Christ child. I hope you and I feel very special. Because God continues to send that same message to us. And I pray that as you hear this message, that you keep it as fresh and as wonderful as when you hear news of a newborn child whom you've never met. But you're excited to see. But this is no human, fleshly, sin-filled child. This is none other than the sinless Savior of the world, sent to fulfill the Father's plan, which includes you and me, which includes a reason to celebrate and a reason to rejoice, just like the angels, just like the shepherds, just like the birth of this child continually leads us to celebrate, not just tonight or tomorrow or maybe a year from now on this date, a reason to celebrate always. What child this is. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 20. There were in the same country shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. Today in the town of David a Savior was born for you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude from the heavenly army praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward mankind. Now when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Now, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they told others the message they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed by what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. These are God's words. Let's sing with the angels as we sing hymn 61, Hark the Herald Angels Sing.
Please stand for prayer. O God, who makes us glad with the yearly remembrance of the birth of your only Son, Jesus Christ, grant that as we joyfully receive him as our Redeemer, so may we also behold him with sure confidence when he shall come to be our judge, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May he who by his incarnation gathered things earthly and heavenly into one fill us with such joy that comes with the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. And we close with hymn 60, Silent Night.